last episode, Aurelius cleans house. After being anointed as the true king of Britain, he sets out to barbecue Vortigern and lays waste to about 90% of the Saxon invaders. Then when he reclaims the country, he decides to erect a monument to all of those who fell due to the Saxon tyranny. Merlin is elected to help with this passion project and the birth of Stonehenge is about to begin. Merlin and the Giant's Ring Merlin tells Aurelius to cool his tits and to stop laughing like a jackass. He then explains that despite how ludicrous it sounds, the stones in question have unique medicinal qualities. Apparently giants long ago took these special stones from Africa and transported them to Ireland. Why? Boom. When water is poured over the stones, they have the ability to create baths which heal wounds. Doubly so if herbs are added to the mixture. Basically, Merlin is fiending for some hot spring action in Britain. The Britons then decide that this is a totally legitimate reason to invade another country, and so they do. Ireland is currently run by this badass dude known as Gillomanius, who doesn't take too kindly to people busting into his country uninvited, even if all they're doing is trying to haul off massive stones. Sadly for Gilly, though, he only succeeds in a little bit of smack talk before having to run away with his tail between his legs as his entire army is devastated. Not sure why the book painted him out to be some titan among men, I guess to make the British look even cooler by proxy of steamrolling him. But anyways, after that bit of fantastical and completely unnecessary bloodshed, the Britons march onwards to Mount Killerus. When they arrive, Merlin challenges the men to see if they can move the stones, knowing full well that they won't be able to. Then he kicks back and enjoys the show, laughing at all of the fail before him. He's a fun guy. Once he's finished needlessly humiliating everyone, he sets about dismantling the Irish version of Stonehenge. The book sadly doesn't explain how he does this, because that would be telling. So they head back to Mount Ambrius in Britain, and invite all of the clergy and citizens to attend the stone stacking in a good old-fashioned wits and pate! Catholics know how to get down! During the festivities, Aurelius hands out the city of York to a dude named Samson, and the city of Legions to Dubrixia. I don't know how to pronounce this. Will these people ever be mentioned again? Probably not. And Merlin, I guess, magics the stones into the same formation that they were in when they were erected in Ireland. No explanation necessary. But, uh-oh, plot twist! Vortigern apparently managed to have sex at least once in his life, because he has a son named Pashent, and he is plotting them murder schemes. But he's not exactly creative, so like Father Lake's son, he recruits the Saxons because it worked so well the first time. Pashent invades the northern regions of Britain with his Saxon army buds and lays waste to whatever they run into. But Aurelius pretty much just waltzes up north and pimp slaps him in one paragraph. So Pashent is like, well, that didn't work. To Ireland! He meets this guy, Gillomanius, who has an understandable beef with the Britons. So they form a <laughs> Aurelius fan club, no Aurelius is allowed, and set sail to a town called Manevia. But this time Uther comes in to curb stomp them because his bro Aurelius is deathly ill in Winchester. This was excellent news for the f Aurelius fan club, and there was much rejoicing. Yay! One of the fan club members, a Saxon named Diopa, comes up to Pashant and states, I'll kill Aurelius, I just need about tree fitty. With the promise of goodies for his efforts, Iopa shaves his head, gussies himself up to look all monk-like, and heads out to Winchester to play doctor. The king's retainers receive him warmly. Hey guy we've never met before or heard of, you can totally come in here and give fluids to our dying king. No background check necessary. So he does that, and Aurelius dies. Yep. Upon Aurelius' passing, a star appears in the sky which shoots out a beam of light that I guess has a ball of fire at the end of it? Then the ball of fire spreads out into the shape of a dragon. Then the dragon's mouth shoots out two beams of light, one pointing to Gaul and the other pointing towards the Irish Sea. Then that splits into seven smaller shafts of light. Uh, I'm just, I'm gonna guess that Yopa must have spiked the drinking water with LSD while he was escaping. Uther, understandably, starts to wig out upon seeing this and assembles his wise men, pretty much just Merlin at this point, to explain what the f*** is up. When asked, Merlin bursts into the boohoos. Seems to be his go-to reaction when asked to explain things to his favorite tools. After crying, he goes into a trance and explains that Aurelius is dead, and that Uther will be victorious in his killing sprees. Also, the beam of light pointing to Gaul symbolizes his future son, Arthur. Best King UK! And the beam of lights pointing to the Irish Sea 
symbolize Uther's daughter and her babies and grandbabies who will rule Britain as minor kings. So Uther's like, I'm reasonable enough to have my doubts, but that all sounded pretty cool. So he marches north and kills the shit out of Pashent and Gilomanias and their army. With that out of the way, he heads back to Winchester, receiving word that Aurelius is to be buried with royal pomp near the monastery of Ambrius inside the giant's ring that he ordered the construction of. Uther gets all anointed and decides that he wants to start a heavy metal band. So he has some craftsmen build two gold dragons for him and changes his name to Uther Pendragon, which means dragon's head. And then he poses for some album covers with a few skanks. Well, it's been a few paragraphs since we last had some attempts at betrayal. So let's get Octa, son of Hengjust, and his buddy Eosa back in the game. Aurelius is dead, so... Treaty? What treaty? Oh, that special sound means it's time to play a fun game! Can you guess how Octa and Eosa plan to attack the British this time? Do they... A. Destroy the country's infrastructure from within B. Sell military secrets to foreign powers Or C. Ally with the Saxons the answer is C. If you chose either A or B, you are not paying attention. And surprise! They start by invading the northern provinces. You must really like that area. So seeing as the Saxons are one note and easy to predict, Uther figures out their plans pretty quickly and heads up north with the entire strength of his kingdom. Surprisingly, the Saxons are able to drive the British back temporarily, and Uther has to request the advice of an old war vet by the name of Borua, Duke of Cornwall. Remember this guy, and not just because he is a Cornwallian, which automatically makes him a baller. The advice? Attack just before dawn, because Saxons aren't morning people. And it works! The Saxons are defeated and Octa and Yosa are captured. Then for the funsies, or I guess since he's just in the area, Uther heads up to Scotland to lay the smack down. The book says that he administers justice in a way that none of his predecessors had been able to do. And considering how his predecessors handled things, that statement terrifies me. After that, Uther heads back to London and has Octa and Eosa jailed. When Eastertide rolls around, Uther gathers up all of the nobles of the kingdom, including that feller Gorlois, to celebrate Easter in style. Gorlois brings his hot wife, and they go with the old French spelling, but I'm just going to say Ygraine, who is described as being the most beautiful woman in all of Britain. That's the only thing of note about her, but that's all that matters anyways. Upon seeing her, Uther is like, Damn, I gotta get me some of that. So he has all of the best dishes and wines sent her way, flirts with her, and probably does those annoying handsome gunpoints people do at parties. Corlewan notices and gets pissed. He drags his hot waifu home without requesting a hall pass, which gives Uther a case of the angers. Hey, you get back here and let me ogle your wife! Corlewan responds by flipping Uther the bird with both hands. I'm sure that this completely silly incident can be solved by peacefully... Nope! Uther assembles his army and sets fire to the towns and castles of the Duchy of Cornwall. Gorlois garrisons his castles and hides his wife in the safest place he has, the castle of Tintagel on the seacoast. Gorlois takes up residence in a fortified camp called Demiliok, and as soon as Uther discovers Gorlois' whereabouts and plans, he immediately cuts off any means of entering or leaving the safehold. Time skip! A whole week passes by, and they're still at a stalemate. Uther summons his best bro and war buddy, Ulfin of Rid Karadok, and whines to him. Man, stealing another dude's wife shouldn't be this hard. I'm the king! Uh, I mean, I'm like, in love, and I will die of my passion and stuff. I need to tag that shit right the funk now! To which Ulfin responds, Don't you know a really smart demon boy thing that is semi-omniscient? And Uther's like, Oh yeah. Merlin was conveniently already at the siege, so that speeds things up. When Merlin sees the state that Uther is in, he becomes bizarrely impressed. So he hooks Uther up with the good shit. He provides a drug that will allow Uther, Ulfin, and himself to appear as their enemies. Uther is Gorlois, Ulfin is Gorlois' best bud Jordan, and Merlin is some rando. They take a polyjuice potion, basically. Minus needing the hair and nails of the individuals, ew. Merlin's plan is as follows. Impersonate these individuals and waltz into Tatagel Castle unsuspected. So Uther goes to Agrain as her husband, Jordan keeps watch, and I guess Merlin sits in the corner of the room and jacks off. That night, Agrain conceives Arthur. I feel sick! But while the cat is away, the mice will play. 
Uther's men decide that since their king is out getting him some, it's time for them to rampage so they can get some free jailbait. They start breaching the walls of Demiliox sans Uther, which causes Gorlois to think he has a chance at winning. Sadly, there's no hope of that because he doesn't have God's backing for whatever reason. So Demiliox is sieged and the soldiers loot and rape like loony savages. Once they're all tuckered out by the rapescapade, some very sore messengers head to Tintagel to report the death of the Duke of Cornwall to Egraine. And as soon as they arrive, she's just like, Ooh, Coco about? What Coco still in my mouth? And the messengers are like, Huh, I'm pretty sure he died and we were all brutalized, but okay. Uther decides that this is a good time to leave some spare change on the dresser and peace out to get a status update from his side. I imagine Merlin is invisible and passed out covered in semen in a corner or something. When Uther finds out what has happened in his absence, he's a bit sad about the death of Gorlois, but also doesn't really care because he got to hit that like the fist of an angry god! Fish bump me bros! I see you all got to tame some strange too! Nice! So after regrouping his army, Uther heads back to Tatagel Castle, captures it, and gets a free grain for his troubles. And the book states, from that day on, they lived together as equals, unified by their great love for each other. And they had a son and a daughter. The son was called Arthur and the girl Anna. And I think that's a pretty good stopping point. For the record, the book never gives information as to how any of the female characters feel about their fates. Not Eggnog, not Estrildius, who was abducted and kept in a cave for seven years, and not Egrain. We can only assume and infer how they might have felt about their experiences, especially seeing as expectations were completely different in those days. Back then, human females were basically just a type of currency that one could stick their dick into. So it's not much of a surprise that Joffrey wouldn't bother to put their ten cents in. Anyways, look forward to the introduction of Arthur, because we finally made it, baby! Until next time, bye!